Okay. Um, Draw the threads together. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Is this working? I seem yep. to have terrible trouble with these microphones. Um, there are an immense number of things to be said in this subject, which is uh, about the relations of the major powers in the world, and I'm just going to make four or five quick points that I've drawn from these papers, um, most of which I've just heard for the first time. So this makes it more interesting, but I'm a journalist, it's so my job to respond at once. Um, the first point that I draw from this, which is probably the most important point, is that this was a discussion about two countries. Um, uh, Europe was not mentioned, not part, of the, not part of the world system, except very briefly by the first speaker, but then he turned, being a good European, immediately to the problems of the US. Uh, the, the, it's so much easier to talk about the problems of the US than the problems of Europe. I'm not going to let them get away with that. Um, but if we think about the US and China, and, and, and um, uh, particularly the paper of Tom Ferguson and uh, Professor Sher, Sh um, what they're telling you is that if you want to understand the politics of these countries, they're actually identical, they're both plutocracies. And therefore, the only interesting question is how will the plutocrats behave? What do they perceive as their self-interest? And from an analytical point of view, that's the conclusion I draw from their studies. From their studies, I suspect they wouldn't want to. And I'm, but I'm going to draw some conclusions from that premise that we should see them as countries in which approximately one percent of the electorate, or as Adair said, 0.1 percent of the electorate actually of the people actually count. Um, the second, uh, and it certainly changes the way you view the world, doesn't it? Um, uh, the great communist socialist state and the great democratic state are in fact uh, both plutocracies. The second point I would make, um, which is obvious, it's implicit in what is said, is um, they didn't really talk at all about uh, cooperation um, and uh, uh, they saw this entirely and rightly in terms of the, the perceived domestic interests of these countries. As I've often remarked, the, uh, the basic characteristic of any international system, and that was very clearly revealed in the Bretton Woods discussions here in 1944, is that there are two classes of countries over which you have no influence whatsoever in the international macroeconomic system. One is surplus countries, and the other is the issuer of the reserve currency, which at that case happened to be the same country. It's no longer the same country but the same point holds. In other words, all the important countries cannot be forced to do anything they don't want to do. Just a basic principle, and that's absolutely fundamental. The third point is then, obviously, you have to discuss what they think is the, in their interest to do, and that's a political process. And that then links very well, I think, with a point, which, which is the real point I was going to make, and the fourth point, which is um, adjustment is hard. The adjustments that these different countries are being asked to do for various reasons is quite painful. That's pretty obvious for, for deficit countries. They have to cut their spending relative to their income, and that means that somebody is going to hurt. That's obvious. So that's clear. But most of us think that surplus countries should have, I mean, you know, people from, from what I call grasshopper countries like the UK and US think, what's so hard about spending more? Uh, why can't the Chinese and the Germans and Japanese enjoy themselves and just spend more on the problems to solve? And the answer to that, and D Professor Dacheco brought this out, is that the, the structures of economies have been built over 50 or 60 years in the case of Germany and Japan and over 20 years in the case of China around systems that generate structural surpluses. They need, vent, they need a vent for their surplus, that is what trade is for, the, is for them, and they need to preserve it. The exchange rate and everything else is fixed around that. That comes also, I think, very clearly from the paper, paper by Louis Kais. So these are structural, deep structural problems. The fourth thing that I want, or fifth thing, sorry, I'm miscounting. Fifth thing, I just want to go very, very briefly through some things that might give you some optimism on the, on, on the way adjustment might work for uh, these entities. And I'm going to add in the Eurozone here, where I'm really deeply pessimistic, but never mind. Okay, let's take the uh, Tom Ferguson view of the world. Um, the US... The US uh, is being manipulated by an incredibly successful plutocratic elite. Uh, so what about the pop hypothesis that they're going to win? And they're going to win by smashing the federal government spending. 
and they will eliminate the deficit by this means, and that will eliminate a large part of the, uh, or at least a part of the driver of the external deficit, um, and uh, uh, the problem of external imbalances will be solved. Lots of other problems would, of course, not be solved. This is evident. But let's suppose that the plutocrats win. I actually think the plutocrats will fail. In fact, the plutocrats, I don't think, you even have any interest in eliminating the deficit. But I think we should explore what how this game plays out. And I want Professor Ferguson to discuss how that game might play out. My own view is there won't be a resolution short of crisis and none of their proposals will close the, the, either the external or domestic deficits. The second question is China. And this where we got, and um, we had a lot of discussion on this. Um, I think the, the most interesting deep model of what's going on here with the suppression of consumption, the incredible investment rate, and the uh, and uh, exports, as I said, as a vent for surplus, the export-led growth model in, in this way, is that it is a very deep structural model of the Chinese economy. And it's incredibly difficult to change a system like that. Uh, and it, this is reinforced with what Professor Scher says because the... Um, because, of course, there's also this very powerful, he's adding a very powerful self-insurance element. And there are many self-insurance elements in this system. But he's reminded us that part of what they want to insure themselves against seems very plausibly is capital flight. And I've always thought of it in a much simpler way, which is there's just so much damn cash money in China. The, the, the ratio of money to GDP is roughly two to one in my memory, in memory serves, so it's approximately four times the external reserves, and they're all at getting negative real returns, so if you've got rid of exchange controls, it's all gonna go out, or a lot of it is going to go out, which, by the way, is one of the reasons they're not gonna get rid of exchange controls. So, the, the, but that's a deep structural sort of thing. The final thing I'd just like to point out on the Eurozone, what's happening in the Eurozone is incredibly simple and very important in the external side. We haven't discussed it, but basically Germany is serially bankrupting all its partners. This has just started. It's obvious. And the end of that is that the Eurozone will be driven into surplus or it will break up. And it's uh, very important to think about this because the Eurozone remains a very big part of the system, but that is, again, internally, internally driven. In, internally driven. So all I'd, I, I would love to go further, but we've, I've made enough of the remarks on this. I think the th way to think about these questions is there are deep structural questions embedded in politics and economic structure of these major powers. And the interesting question is to ask whether there are any internal forces, which are of course include pressures from outside, like inflation, like things like this, which might force any or all of these countries to decide that a change in their external position is desirable. And by the way, I'm most optimistic, but not very, least pessimistic about China, because I think the interests in, doing, in changing are so obvious, and they probably still have a government.